Hi everyone! So today we're going to talk about hair loss and this is part two which discusses the prescriptions and procedures I do in my office or that others may do in their dermatology practice. I would recommend that you watch part one which discusses androgenetic alopecia and telogen effluvium, these two diagnoses in detail, as well as goes over the treatment options that you can do at home. Without watching part one, part two might be confusing but I will try my best to review some of the concepts that I went over in part one. So welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Dr. Swati Cannon and I am a board certified dermatologist in California. And since COVID 2020, I have seen so many patients suffering from hair loss. I myself started seeing female pattern hair loss. And so it really is a distressing condition for a lot of patients. And so I hope that these videos really help you at least get the ball rolling on treatments. Now, androgenetic alopecia is the most common form of hair loss affecting both men and women. And in men, this is called male patterned baldness, which basically presents with hair thinning, loss of hair along the frontal scalp and the crown of the scalp, as well as the receding hairline. In women, it presents as widening of the hair part, which then becomes gradual and leads to kind of overall hair thinning along the frontal part of the scalp. This is due to a combination of genetics and hormones. And often, androgenetic alopecia can be unmasked by excessive hair shedding called telogen effluvium. Telogen effluvium happens when the hair goes from the antigen or the growth phase to the telogen or the resting phase, which then leads to hair shedding. And this happens pretty quickly. And this is due to a stressor like surgery, job loss, and illness. For most patients, though, telogen effluvium does go away, but in some, it can become chronic and thus lead to an exacerbation of their underlying androgenetic alopecia. It's normal to lose 50 to 150 hairs a day, but in telogen effluvium, most patients will lose 300 to 700 hairs a day, which is obviously a lot higher of a number. Now let's talk about treatments. In part one, I spoke about using minoxidil 5% or Rogan 5%, which is over the counter. Now in my office, I actually give a prescription strength minoxidil, which is six to 7%. And this is through a compounding pharmacy called Hair Stim Labs. This minoxidil can be compounded with retinoic acid or salicylic acid and these acids help the minoxidil to penetrate deeper into the hair follicle. When we look at the skin, the topmost layer of the skin is called the stratum corneum. And so the stratum corneum is really one of the biggest barriers to penetration of topical medications. And these acids thin the stratum corneum, thus allowing the penetration of minoxidil deeper into the hair follicles. We can also compound minoxidil with other topical medications that I will go over in this video. We often combine multiple treatments to treat hair loss, but minoxidil really is the cornerstone of therapy. And so everything else is an adjunct to minoxidil. One of the things that we can do also is microneedling plus minoxidil. So there have been studies that show that microneedling plus minoxidil is much more effective than minoxidil alone. And this makes sense because microneedling creates tiny little injuries into the skin and that allows the minoxidil molecule to go in deeper into the hair follicle, thus exerting a better effect. And this is very similar to laser assisted drug delivery that we perform for scars, acne scars, and other things where we create channels into the skin to allow better penetration of these drug molecules. The derma rollers that you can buy at home, those don't count. The microneedling injury that we create is actually one millimeter to 1.5 millimeter deep because that's how deep the hair follicles are. The derma rollers that you can buy off of Amazon, they do not go that deep. And what they do is that when you're dragging them onto the skin, they're creating tiny little injuries onto the skin. This can then cause inflammation and scarring without really giving you much more benefit. So I see all of these YouTube videos and TikTok videos on derma rollers, and I feel like half of my job is to basically say, please don't get all that stuff. Don't waste your money on it. It may seem like a good option, but it's, it's not. We can also do low level laser therapy or red lights in office. I spoke about this in part one as well, because you can get the red helmet for home use. However, they are pretty expensive. These red lights emit a wavelength of about 630 to 616 nanometers. This wavelength of light penetrates into the cell causing kind of excitement of the mitochondria. I feel like I'm taking you to your biology uh, class, but it excites the mitochondria leading to a cascade of events, which then results in cellular proliferation, meaning the cells, you get more hair cells, let's say it leads to repair and regeneration. So this is actually called photobiomodulation. And we use this even in other dermatologic conditions. So for example, 
example, we may use yellow light for chronic wounds or ulcers that are not healing. So all of this to say that lasers and lights are very cool and we have a lot of uses for them within dermatology. I usually combine low level laser therapy with other modalities like PRP and Rogaine, I don't use it just by itself. So that leads us to the discussion of PRP or platelet rich plasma, which is one of the most common procedures that I do in my office for hair loss. And it is pretty effective. You come into the office, we draw your blood, that blood then gets spun down in a centrifuge machine and all the heavier red blood cells, they settle down at the bottom. Then in the middle, we have platelet rich plasma. And on top, we have the platelet poor plasma. Platelet rich plasma contains like all of the good things that you want. So it contains peptides like proteins and cytokines and growth factors that help with cellular regeneration and repair. And it doesn't contain any of the pro-inflammatory molecules like heme. Heme is in your red blood cells, which can be pro-inflammatory. So it doesn't contain any of that. So we then take out the platelet-rich plasma from the tube and inject it into the scalp. Now it does take a series of three to four treatments spaced every four to six weeks to really see an effect. And you won't even notice the difference until several months after your last PRP treatment. So you really have to be patient. Now, most studies show that you need at least three PRP treatments to see a difference. If you only do one or two treatments, you're not gonna see any improvement in your hair loss. PRP is cosmetic, it is not covered by insurance. And so it can get expensive for patients who are budget conscious. You know, you continue to have hair loss because we can't always fight the hormonal influences controlling hair loss. So you may need maintenance treatments with one PRP treatment every three, six, or 12 months. And everyone's different, so we have to tailor these therapies to you. So let's move on to prescription medications. For men, we use two main oral medications, finasteride and dutasteride. Finasteride is commonly known as Propecia, which is the brand name. And there is a lot of controversy on finasteride and rightfully so. Finasteride is actually used for prostate gland enlargement because prostate gland enlargement is also caused by a response to DHT. DHT is dihydrotestosterone. And as I discussed in part one, it really is a leading cause for hair loss. So finasteride blocks the 5-alpha reductase, which is the enzyme that converts testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. This then results in an improvement of hair loss and of course helps with prostate gland enlargement as well. The main issue with finasteride is the side effect. I mean, it does have common side effects that are not that worrisome, but the most concerning side effect is sexual dysfunction. And this can present in different ways, but it presents in about 10 to 15% of patients that take it. And in some patients, the sexual dysfunction can actually be permanent even after stopping finasteride. So that's why it's really important to speak to a board certified dermatologist about this medication, especially if you're interested, because you need to know and be aware of the risks. Now, I have given finasteride to a lot of men and they find that it really helps their hair loss or without any risk of dysfunction in them, but it's a very individual choice and something that you have to make after you are educated. I also have given finasteride to women, but it is not my top choice, obviously. I mean, I give it as a second line or kind of after after everything else has failed. It's just not as well studied in women, so I prefer other medications, which leads us to the female anti-androgen medication called spironolactone. And like all things in medicine, we also discovered this by accident. So spironolactone is actually used for heart disease and blood pressure, and we notice that it has anti-androgen effects. So in dermatology, we use it for female pattern hair loss, we use it for hormonal acne, and for polycystic ovarian syndrome. For hair loss, we often need a higher dose of spironolactone at about 200 milligrams. But I don't start at 200 milligrams. I start at a much lower dose at about 25 to 50 milligrams, and then I slowly increase as the patient can tolerate. The main side effect from spironolactone is orthostatic hypotension. This means that the blood pressure lowers, and so when you stand up from a seating position, you kind of feel dizzy. So if patients have this, obviously we can't increase the dose or we just have to discontinue the medication. The other side effects include breast tenderness or menstrual irregularities, but this is not very common. And then the concerning side effect from this was the fact that it can alter potassium levels. But we have recent studies that show healthy young women don't really get an alteration in their potassium levels on this medication, so it's relatively safe. Now, in some women, I may still check potassium levels before and during treatment, but honestly, like I have never really encountered any issues in this arena from spironolactone. So remember when we were talking about the minoxidil 
oil formulations, while we can also compound minoxidil or Rogaine with topical finasteride and topical spironolactone, and this can be pretty helpful without all of the side effects that come from oral medications. Obviously, topical formulations of these medications is not going to be as helpful as oral pills, but for patients who want to try the topical, I think it's definitely worth trying. And I also compound this through a pharmacy called Hair Stim Labs, which most people find pretty affordable and easy to use. And finally, let's talk about hair transplant. So I do hair transplant in my dermatology practice, and I find that it's one of the most rewarding procedures because it brings so much joy and happiness to the patient when they see the results. It truly is life-changing, and I really love doing it, even though it's very to be honest, it's a very cumbersome procedure. So in my practice, we use a device called Smart Graft, which is a device based off of follicular unit extraction. So in the past, when we did hair transplants, they would excise or surgically like cut out the back portion of the skin and scalp. So they would just like cut out like a slit and then that area would be stitched up or stapled. They then would take this piece of skin with all the hair in it and divide up all the hair follicles, separate them out, and then insert them into the area of hair loss. But this often led to a pretty long surgical recovery, bruising, pain obviously, and a wide scar on the back of the scalp, which was like a telltale sign of hair transplant. With follicular unit extraction, what's really cool is that we just take out individual hair follicles, you know, follicular units of one to three hair follicles, and we spread them out throughout the back of the scalp. These hair follicles then get further divided. We then make slits into the area where there's hair loss and insert these follicular units into those slits. The nice thing is that because the extraction sites are so tiny that the resulting scars are pinpoint, which then blends in a lot easier, the recovery is a lot faster, and there is barely any scars that indicate that you had anything done. And that's what we do now. I do combine hair transplants with PRP on the same day, and that's because PRP helps with repair and regeneration. I also recommend that patients continue their PRP treatments either every three months or every six months just as a way to protect their investment. That is it. So that's an extensive review of hair loss and treatments that you can do at home and treatments that we provide in a dermatologist office. You know, because hair loss is so complex and we have so many different types of treatments, the discussion can be pretty long. So hair loss appointments in my office always take a long time. Now, some of the treatments like spironolactone and finasteride, they can be covered by insurance, but most of the other treatments are considered cosmetic. Insurance companies don't think that androgenetic alopecia is harmful to your health. So while I think it can definitely be psychologically distressing, they do not deem it to be harmful. And that's why a lot of these treatments are not covered. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions or concerns or comments, please let me know below and I will respond. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you can stay tuned for any new videos that I make on skincare and within the field of dermatology. Have a wonderful day.